Hi, it's Tuesday, October 8th. We're still watching major Hurricane Milton here in the southern Gulf of Mexico. Expected to turn northeastward today and make a run at the west central Florida coastline where landfall is expected somewhere in here Wednesday night or Thursday morning. That landfall time has shifted just a little bit later relative to yesterday as the storm is expected to be a little bit slower. A wide swath of significant to potentially extreme impacts will occur in some areas chief of which is coastal storm surge inundation, which will cause the most life-threatening hazard along the coastline and a long swath of it, along with inland flooding potential and hurricane force winds that could extend all the way across the peninsula and then storm surge flooding in the northeastern part of Florida on the eastern coastline as well. So much of the Florida peninsula end up into Georgia expecting impacts from Hurricane Milton. If we take a closer look here, the storm was a Category 5 hurricane yesterday. It had a pinhole eye only 4 miles wide at one point yesterday. That kind of structure is typically unstable, so what we usually get is a sequence of eye wall replacement cycles where an outer ring forms around the inner eye, the inner eye slowly disintegrates, and then the outer ring contracts and replaces the original eye wall, and it's usually larger than it was before. You can see that here. We don't have a pinhole eye anymore. We have a more average-sized eye, about 12 miles in diameter, according to the reconnaissance aircraft, and you can see that it's just now consolidating and beginning to clear out again. It's still partially cloud-filled here, and the storm did weaken about 30 millibars during that ERC process, which is not at all unusual for a tiny storm like we had yesterday. There has been some periodic fragmentation of the northwestern eyewall here. There could be a touch of mid-level shear that is not well modeled. It's difficult to tell what's going on there, but there has been some periodic reorganization of the inner core, and as we've talked about in previous videos, the expectations for there to be fluctuations in Milton's intensity while it's north of the Yucatan Peninsula in this category four or five range. So it wouldn't be surprising to see the intensity go up and down in little bursts and sequences, and we could have even another eyewall replacement cycle before it's all said and done. This is the aircraft reconnaissance data from the plane that's in there right now. The pressure had risen yesterday. It got as low as 897 millibars. It was up to 930 millibars earlier in the day. We've just now seen it start to fall again down to 927 millibars in the latest pass as this new eye begins to consolidate and become a little bit better defined. You can see the hurricane force wind field all in purple here. And you can also see how the hurricane is kind of wobbling around. We had a bit of a northeastward jog, followed by now an east-southeastward jog, which you might have noticed in the infrared satellite image. There's just a little bit of an east or east-southeast motion to the eye right now. We are expecting it to imminently turn back towards the northeast and make its move toward the western central Florida coastline. Of course, these wobbles do matter, and we'll be watching them carefully for any systematic trends in terms of the landfall location that is expected on Wednesday night or Thursday morning. But remember that a broad swath of impacts is going to occur regardless of exactly where the eye moves ashore. This is the radar picture out of Cancun, Mexico, the eye is just now coming into view. You can see a very solid ring has now formed and replaced the original eye wall. So this is a well-formed eye now, and that explains why the storm seems to be re-strengthening as of this recording. You can also see there's some hinting of outer banding around that eye, and if you look at the radar data out of the aircraft, you also saw hints of the primary eye wall, but also still some banding kind of around it. That could facilitate uh, another eye wall replacement cycle maybe later today or tonight. We'll see. They're very difficult to predict. Again, the expectation is for there to be fluctuations up and down in Milton's intensity, but still in this extreme category four to five range in general. This is the ECMWF upper level wind forecast, and we've been talking about this for days now, but the storm is currently in a light shear environment in general, but as it gains latitude and moves toward Florida, Conditions will get more hostile for the hurricane in the sense that its maximum winds will start coming down, but the wind field is going to broaden out. And so that's kind of exchanging one evil for another. As the storm moves uh, toward the northeast here, you'll see that it gets close to the jet, and there is a, a jet streak providing some upper-level outflow that keeps the storm core going, but some of this westerly flow coming into the storm increases the vertical shear and begins to develop asymmetries in the storm. You'll see this happen on the ECMWF where you have a symmetric core of green which indicates deep mid-level moisture and you can see a tight core of dark green there but as it starts to move toward the Florida coastline we do start to get asymmetries where most of the green is on the northern and eastern half of the storm the southwest side starts to dry out 
And the key here is whether or not the eye wall gets significantly disrupted prior to landfall. And right now it's still kind of on a knife's edge. If it's going to start eroding, it could be at the very last minute. We are expecting gradual weakening of the hurricane's max winds. So we're unlikely to see a category four or five storm, but it could still be a category three major hurricane. So in terms of wind impacts, expect winds well in excess of 100 miles per hour possible with Milton as it comes ashore. But the bigger problem is really that the wind field's going to expand a whole lot as it's coming in, and that will drive a lot more storm surge into the coastline. You can see on the CCMWF run, uh, the track is just south of Tampa Bay on this particular run. It's been fairly steady there on the last couple of cycles. This is the GFS showing a similar uh, look to the storm, holding together a little bit longer than the ECMWF with a symmetric green core, even right up to the last minute. And only at landfall is that eyewall starting to erode on the GFS. You can see that landfall location is also just south of Tampa Bay on this particular run. There has been a slightly concerning trend over the last 24 hours in some models regarding the vertical shear that we're hoping will disrupt Milton at least a little bit before landfall. But if you look at the, the southern edge of this jet streak over Texas and Louisiana, if you look at that green boundary, the last few runs of the European model have seen this boundary shift a little bit toward the north in recent runs. You can see that shift there. That kind of lowers the amount of westerly flow hitting Milton in the backside as it's coming ashore and increases the odds of the eye wall holding together until it crosses the coastline. So we'll keep a close eye on that. Again, there's going to be some, some wiggle room here in exactly what the max winds are in the hurricane at the time of landfall, but the bottom line is expect winds in excess of 100 miles an hour and possibly catastrophic storm surge in some areas of the west central Florida coastline, regardless of the exact intensity of the storm as it comes in. This is the half a model showing a depiction of what this wind field will look like near the landfall time. And if I go backwards to, you know, the current time, you can see, you know, how small essentially the hurricane is now. Uh, this everything in green is tropical storm force or stronger, 40 miles per hour or stronger. And it's relatively small. But if I go forward here, you'll see how this wind field expands as the storm interacts with the upper level jet stream. And now the hurricane force wind field in purple is almost as large as the tropical storm force wind field is currently so you can see the basically doubling in size of the hurricane you know this is a problem because for storm surge it's not just the strength of the winds it's the extent of the winds that really matter for pushing water so the fact that the hurricane is this large as it's coming into the coast means a lot of water level rise is going to happen in some of these places and it could be near historic levels in certain locations depending on how this goes and that's why we're communicating extreme danger in some of these evacuation zones in west central florida you can see that we are going to get the hurricane force winds as well this is a particular model run that actually goes north of tampa bay i showed you the ecmwf and gfs that go just on the southern side of tampa bay like this this particular model goes into pinellas county just north of the bay Obviously, some of these tracks are worse for Tampa Bay specifically. If you get a track to your north into northern Pinellas, then you get more push of water directly into the bay on the south side of the eye. So we'll keep a close eye on these trends, but it's important to realize that there's definitely some wiggle room in the exact landfall location and different tracks will be worse for different people. But there's a risk here and we're just not going to know the exact hurricane landfall before it's too late to react which is why folks need to leave if they're in the area that's deemed as high risk. Also note that there will be strong southwesterly onshore flow well to the south of the hurricane landfall point, regardless of exactly where it crosses the coastline. Obviously, if you're in areas like Charlotte Harbor and the Fort Myers area, a track south of Tampa Bay is worse for you than a track north of Tampa Bay. But even a track north of Tampa Bay would result in very significant water level rises and storm surge inundation flooding in these areas. And then you'll see as the storm crosses the Florida Peninsula, it may go up basically the I-4 corridor. And then what you're going to see is a ribbon of very strong flow on the north side of the hurricane as it emerges on the eastern side of Florida. This is because the storm is starting to interact with a cold air mass and it will start transitioning to a non-tropical cyclone after it crosses Florida. So you'll see a sharp gradient in wind speed here where a very fast ribbon of air, possibly hurricane force, starts hitting northeastern Florida out of the northeast and note that this is onshore and we 
are going to get storm surge flooding in places like Jacksonville, the St. Johns River, and up and down this coastline extending well up off of this map into Georgia and possibly southern South Carolina as well. So realize that there are coastal storm surge hazards and wind issues to deal with on the backside of Florida too, as well as the inland corridor where the eye tracks where we will see extensive power outages and potential for hurricane force wind gusts throughout the peninsula along the storm track. Speaking of that, this is the National Hurricane Center official forecast, and you'll see everything in red here is a hurricane warning, bracketing the I-4 corridor, so you can see the extensive uh, area of potential wind impacts, and blue is tropical storm warning, so that's all of the peninsula here under a tropical storm or hurricane warning, and some tropical storm watches also for coastal Georgia and South Carolina as well due to that ribbon of northeasterly air that I just mentioned. Again, this is expected to be a potentially major hurricane, category three or stronger at landfall, so expect winds in excess of 100 miles per hour near the coastline. You can see that the landfall time has shifted a little slower. Yesterday it was about 8 p.m. Eastern time, 7 p.m. Central, but now that time is still offshore. So now the time is slipping into the overnight hours of Wednesday, perhaps the wee hours of Thursday morning, on the current track. That gives you maybe a, a little extra time to prepare, but time is waning now. Peak storm surge forecast. You know, again, this could be, you know, potentially even historic levels of flooding depending on the track. Tampa Bay, in the worst case, could see 10 to 15 feet of storm surge. The all time record is 11. So that's the kind of event we're dealing with here, especially if the track is north of the bay. That's when you can get the highest values. This is a forecast from the SARA. Uh, modeling that shows that the current NHC track, which is along the southern part of Tampa Bay, results in the maximum surge around Sarasota. Now, what I'm going to show you here is, you know, yes, in some places like Tampa Bay, the details of the track at the end will matter. You'll note that with the, the current track technically south of the bay by just a hair, you don't get quite as much water level rise here. You still get up to four to five feet in places, but if you look at the previous forecast from last night that had the track just a hair north of or through the bay, you see how much higher the water level rises are here. So yes, details do matter in certain places. They don't so much in others. So you'll notice that Sarasota still gets the worst of it on both of those tracks, and you'll notice that Port Charlotte, Charlotte Harbor, and the Caloosahatchee River in Fort Myers still get significant water level rises even if the track is north of Tampa. It does get a little bit worse if the track is farther to the south, but you'll see an extensive area of significant inundation regardless of the exact track. For Tampa, a little bit more of a nail biter, but you're not going to know potentially until the last moment whether or not the eye is going north or south. And even if it goes south, you're still getting several feet of inundation in some of these areas. That green color is still a lot of flooding. So keep in mind that there's a lot of risk here. And yes, there is some wiggle room in exactly how the impacts go down for certain locales. But this gives you kind of a reasonable worst case scenario in terms of water level rise all along the western Florida coastline. And if you're in those evacuation zones and you're being asked to leave, it's because there's a significant risk of inundation flooding that area. This is a nice tool from the National Hurricane Center website, hurricanes.gov. This is the potential maximum inundation storm surge flooding. This is the level that, you know, in the worst case could happen in your area. So you can zoom in even to street view and see all the places that could potentially get inundated here. Red is greater than nine feet of inundation, orange is six feet or more and so on. So you can go up and down the coastline, get familiar with your evacuation zone and know the areas that are at significant risk here. Just realize that it's, it's really tough to escape storm surge flooding and you wanna get out if you can, if you're in these areas that are likely to get covered in seawater. We're also going to have inland flooding concerns and potentially high risk now extending near and north of the I-4 corridor. I didn't show you this. Let me show you the, the radar picture really quick from the HAFS model. You'll note that the storm, you know, it is going to get progressively asymmetric. So right now you have this kind of symmetric ball of rain around the eye wall, but as the vertical shear gets applied to the storm, you are going to see the northern eye wall become the wettest side. So the very heaviest rain will be to the left of the storm track or to the north of the storm track. So you'll see the heaviest corridor of rain like this near and north 
of the storm track. It will be a little bit drier on the south side, which is good news. So that doesn't mean you can't get flash flooding from some of the rain bands that kind of extend out ahead of the hurricane like this. But the very heaviest rainfall amounts will be near and north of the hurricane. So I-4 corridor and northward currently expecting the highest flash flooding risk with risk extending across the entire Florida Peninsula in general. That'll be about it for this video. We'll continue to watch Hurricane Milton as it begins to make its move toward the west central Florida coastline. Everyone please utilize this last full day for preparations to its fullest. This is your last full day before it starts to get dangerous on Wednesday. And uh, please leave if you're in evacuation zone that's getting ordered to leave uh, storm surge flooding. Very difficult to escape. Uh, everyone please just stay safe and smart this week. You can follow me on X slash Twitter at Tropical Tidbits for more frequent technical updates on the storm throughout the day when I have time to post, and I'll have another video tomorrow morning. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.